Welcome to Reality Creative Video. I'm Hermes. And today I want to talk about the basics of what is a colloidal and how do we create colloidal nanoparticles. Uh, much, I know you guys that follow me every week. You've seen all my videos and you've extracted the information. But what if you're new and you're, not, you're new to colloidal nanoparticles and you want a, uh, a, break, you know, a simple breakdown on it or just a, an overlook on how this process works? Well, that's what this video is about. Now, I am going to cover various things uh, here that uh, I might just glance over in my other videos. We're going to cover them uh, in a little detail here so that uh, if you know nothing about colloidals, afterwards, you're going to know plenty. What is a colloidal? A colloidal is a metal that is suspended in distilled water. This is silver, and it's a metal. And for our purposes today, we're going to take this metal and create suspended colloidal particles out of it. Now, colloidal particles are suspended. And there are two kinds of particles. They are called ionic particles and colloidal particles. Ionic particles are dissolved particles. They're dissolved in the water. They also carry a charge, you chemists out there. That charge makes an ionic stick to the inside of the body, which may or may, may not be good. It's ionics, you have to be very careful with ionic substances because they can build up toxic levels in the body if you take too much. And they're not wholeheartedly effective because they are dissolved in the liquid and they hold a charge, they do not want to come out of the liquid very easily. And so the body actually has to break down the water medium that they're dissolved in in order to extract the mineral. And a lot of that is wasted and doesn't go into the system. So you wind up with an ionic, you wind up having to take a whole lot of stuff that you don't actually need. Enter colloidals. Now, because of the colloidal process, the colloidal particles are much larger, and they don't have a charge. So they're free-floating in the solution of water. So when you take a colloidal particle and just a colloidal particle, it's already bioavailable for your body. It doesn't have to break it down. doesn't have to do anything. If it doesn't use the colloidal, it gets expunged out of your body, so it doesn't actually build up any toxicity. And it's, like I said, it's, it's more useful to the body. So this is why colloidals are actually extremely useful to the body, because the body doesn't have to do anything. If it needs the colloidal, it uses the colloidal. The colloidal doesn't have a charge, it's not attracted to anything, so the body itself has to grab the colloidal through a charge process and attach it to the cells which it readily does if it needs it. So that's the difference between ionic and colloidal, basically. We're making... So what does a colloidal look like in the microscope, in the water? That's what it looks like. That is a 12 parts per million colloidal silver solution under the video microscope. Now let's talk a, just a brief minute about how that spectacular picture is created. Well, that's something that I sort of designed myself. A laser containment system. But let's, let's just backtrack. In the old days, <laughs> old days, what we would do with our colloidal solution is we would get a laser and put it through the liquid and, and see the amount of laser that's been picked up. Colloidal particles are, are large, so the laser, they will reflect off of the laser. And you'll have a line going through the water when you have colloidals in there. So I had the great idea of why not build a laser containment system and use a microscope to get a close-up picture of these colloidals. And that's what I did. With a 3D printer, that's my 3D printer over there, my latest one anyway, I made this. It's basically a, this is a laser pointer 
This is just holds it steady, and this is the cup. In here is a crystalline dish, crystallizing dish, and it goes in here. It has a small amount of liquid in there, and I will push the button, and as you can see, the laser goes across. And then the microscope can go down and take a look, a close-up look at the reflection of these colloidal particles. Now, if I had... Let's talk about the electrolysis process, being it is the integral part of this whole, situ whole uh, thing. All right, first, we're going to use distilled water, and we're going to fill my 500 milliliter, 600 milliliter beaker to 500 milliliters. This is distilled water, and this is what distilled water looks like on the microscope before we start. You can see how clear it is compared to the other picture that I showed you. This is a beaker top to hold the rods in place. And I'm going to put this in here like that. And this is silver, piece of silver. Now we're this is um, going to be our cathode. This is going to supply the material, and the positive of the power supply gets hooked up to that. See the red? Now, the negative is going to be an anode, and I use carbon for an anode. But you can use copper, silver, various other things. The anode, nothing ever comes off the anode. The anode is the supplier of the electrons that are going to blast the uh, metal off of here. What happens is the uh, metal, when we attach the negative, we take this, we're going to take this uh, carbon rod, we're going to stick it in here on the other side of our uh, apparatus, and I'm going to hook the negative of the power supply to that. Now, when I turn on the switch, what's going to happen is electrons are going to flood into the system and you're going to get a reaction. I'm going to show you a video of a reaction. This happens to be a gold uh, reaction, cooking colloidal gold, and it, gold is very dramatic, and you can actually see the reaction going on when you engage the power supply. Silver is uh, very anticlimactic. You really can't see what's going on, and it takes a while to see any change. So when you turn this on, electrons are going to flow from the negative to the positive. They're going to blast the material off of here. So the silver is going to go into the liquid. And it's, going to, it's going to be deficient by two electrons. At this point, it's not a colloidal yet. Now it wants to be attracted to this anode and get put on this anode. Now we're going to make it harder for it to do that. We're going to put a stirrer in here. And we're going to turn... Turn on the stirrer, and we're going to spin this liquid. Just agitate it a little bit because we want to make it really hard for the metal, for the this metal to get attached to the anode. Because anything that gets attached to the anode does not become a colloidal. So we engage the stirrer. Now, what happens is the silver or whatever metal you're doing goes into the solution. It is deficient in two electrons, but because there's a whole mess load of electrons now floating around in this water, it quickly picks up those two electrons and becomes neutral. And you know what happens when it becomes neutral? It no longer can attach itself to the anode anymore. It has now become trapped in the liquid as a colloidal. Now then, this is the weird part that happens. Now, van der Waal forces react and take, you know, take over. And they cause these free-floating colloidals that now cannot attach to anything to start clumping together and get larger. And uh, so they'll get, the, that'll clump together to a certain size and then that will stop. But now these nanoparticle colloidals are held together with these van der Waal forces, which in itself is, is weird quantum mechanics. So that's how we're able to suspend the particles 
in the liquid. Let's talk about the logistics of cooking a colloidal. There, when you cook a colloidal solution, you have a target in mind, uh, parts per million, if you that you want to achieve. Now, in this particular batch, I want to create colloidal silver clear, and to do that, I need to cook it to 10 to 12 parts per million. If I go over 15 parts per million, I'm going to get colloidal silver brown. But the point of the thing is you need, all your colloidals are going to be cooked to a certain parts per million depending on what you want to use it for. So um, how do we do, how do we determine the parts per million? Well, I first off you're going to weigh, I weigh this uh, cathode. I weigh the anode and I weigh the cathode at the beginning. Technically, the anode doesn't gain any any weight, but if you wanted to be sure, you would weigh the anode and the cathode, and you weigh them both afterwards, and that will give you the parts per million that uh, you have in the solution, provided you don't see stuff floating around in the liquid. And that's the the, pro the problem. If uh, especially with the higher parts per million solutions, not everything go becomes a colloidal; it becomes a solid and starts floating around as debris. That doesn't count. That's why the microscope is probably the best way to tell what your parts per million are because you just have to eyeball it and say, okay, this is a uh, 10 or 15 parts per million solution. But in order to get to that point, you actually have to weigh the rods in order to know what a 10 or 15 parts per million solution looks like in the microscope. So that's what we do. I have a three-digit scale, standard chemistry stuff, and I will weigh the rod. So I weighed this rod at the, before I start, and then when I'm done, I will weigh the rod again. And what I, now, what I normally do is I will cook this stuff for 15 or 20, 20 uh, it depends on the stuff. With silver, I'm going to cook this for 30 minutes, then I'm going to stop the process, and I'm going to weigh the rod and see how much silver has gone into the solution. And then I'll take a Pick, I'll t I will fill up this jar with some of the solution and put it in the microscope and see if make sure that I have what I'm looking for. If I need to cook it further, I will cook it more for another 15 minutes. And I will do the same thing. I will weigh the rod, see how much silver or whatever it is that we, we have in the, in the liquid and go from there. Now, a 10 parts per million solution will, in 500 milliliters, will require 5 milligrams of material off of that silver rod. So that would be my target, to aim for the 5 milligrams of silver. Now, the picture that you've seen before, that I'll show it again, of the silver I got I already cooked in here, is about 12... 12 to 15 parts per million. It's no more than 15 parts per million, but it's somewhere around there. 10, 12, 14, something like that. So that's it. That's the basics of creating a colloidal substance and what colloidal substances are good for. So uh, each metal is good for different things. I cooked silver here today, or showed you how to cook s silver. Silver is anti antimicrobial, antibiotic, antiviral kind of thing, but uh, other colloidals do other things. They're all nanoparticle stuff way out there. Uh, as Even though we, the colloidals have been around for a while, you're going to see a resurgence of colloidals in the future. Nanoparticles, at least nanoparticle work in colloidals in the future. I'm Hermes, this is Reality Creative Video, and I will talk to you again soon.